Good morning. Thank you for watching this presentation. There are two main questions that I would like to address. One is how can immersive environments expand the range of educational dynamics and subjects that online learning can provide? And the other is how can we have widespread deployment of immersive environments, actually use it in everyday practices? The first thing we must consider is what is immersion. There are many works on this topic, but most people only think of immersion as putting your head inside a headset. It goes be way beyond that. Indeed, the systems, the technology can provide lots of immersion, but it's mostly a psychological phenomenon. So the narrative can get you immersed. The engagement can make you forget what is going on around you. And the most powerful immersion is when everything gets combined, the narrative, the technological systems, and also the engagement in your challenges and activities. Recently, I've done with Dennis Beck and Peter Koshea from the Immersive Learning Research Network, a survey of surveys from the past 20 years of research on immersive learning. And what we found out in terms of the uses are lots of clusters of typical cases that show you how this can be used and how it has not yet been used. So for instance, a major kind of uses is complementing current learning activities by providing emphasis to something that is already typical, by providing multimodal interaction so that you can get in touch with the same content from different senses and complement, combine the contexts, the media or the items you have. Another major use is simulating. Lots of system interaction there, lots of narrative, lots of challenge. It means basically to try and replicate the physical world or for logistics, trying to avoid taking people into a laboratory, trying to avoid driving people to a place you want to visit like a factory and rather bring them virtually to the same events, bring them together. Then another kind of use is exploring Data collection is a single blue dot in the middle of that back pane. And with a bit more instances, interactive manipulation and exploration of smart objects. This is definitely a promising area for more exploration. Another kind of use is accessing. That means using it for perspective switching, like embodying someone else, or by viewing something from a different time, different size, giving access to something you would not have because it's highly radioactive or because your mobility is impaired or seeing the invisible, like seeing the air flows, seeing the microscopic world. The major, the most common approach is for experiencing, giving people augmented context with augmented reality overlays, giving them emotional and cultural experiences when they become aware of this self-response, of this metacognition, and changing their behavior by making them experience what can go wrong and right with different ways to act. Also, pretty much used is the kind of immersion where we have very little technology, but lots of challenge and some narrative, like skill training like engagement with a task, promoting that engagement, and for collaboration. So this is the panorama of users of immersive learning environments. And this gives you a map of what you can do right now with lots of examples from 20 years of research and practice. But it also highlights these gaps, these areas where there are very little reports and where so much more can be done. Some examples of what I've done previously are, for instance, the Young Europeans for Democracy project, where the European Commission asked us to prepare something that schools could use to teach the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the main uh, dates, the foundational dates of the European Union. So in this kind of activity, a pair of students had to match part of the description of what happened on the date with the other half. But somewhere on the floor and somewhere standing up, they could only do this by talking to each other. So they had to actually communicate and share their viewpoints. And so we simply turned what would be a boring, just matching activity into a team dynamic, a conversational activity.
in the same project, we also did some 3D sculptures with no motion, because it's, it, this is an example of how you do not need to rise very high on technology to achieve significant impacts. We just made these 3D sculptures and students like that avatar called SP Belgica 2 on the, on the bottom right, students would walk within these sculptures and the teacher could use this, these experiences to raise discussion. So in this case, there is a fire in that house, but there is an injured person who happens to be black. And so this can be the cue for a discussion on what is your priority, the house or the injured? Does the race affect your decision? This kind of immersive experience where you are within the scene can really make the discussion change. This is a different project, a project about handball coach training. So one of my PhD students had documented the attack tactics of France and Spain in a world championship of handball and wanted to use them for training handball coaches. The problem is that videos don't give the full perspective and sometimes if you use real teams, you have to practice a lot and some player is always wrong, is looking where the player shouldn't be looking, it's running faster, slower, not really executing, you cannot review. So what we came up with was this kind of magnet board where you use a timeline to describe the tactics, you'd save that, and then within the virtual world, the tactics you had stored were replicated in 3D, could be paused, rewinded, forwarded, and back, back there on, the, um, on those chairs were the professor and the students. So basically, you were studying handball tactics by watching handball and doing, uh, doing the exact theoretical concepts of the sport. So this shows you how you can extend uh, online learning to other fields and actually improve physical learning because this can be used for that purpose too. For the Portuguese Air Force, we provided a simulation of the assembly and disassembly process of the F-16's aircraft engines. This basically was not meant to practice the technical bits of that disassembly because they were perfectly able to do it with the physical items, but they wanted the airmen to be able to practice the coordination as a team. And that is more dangerous when you are working with real engines, that is more expensive, and also it makes engines be stopped and unable to be used while the training is taking place. So they wanted really these four people to be able to practice the communication modes, the coordination of tasks. And that's a really, really exciting thing to do with immersive environments. Another example is about negotiating the spatial arrangement of objects. In this case, we did it in a school, but we also had interested parties that wanted to confront the testimonies of um, former fighters. We also had people wanting to share perspectives on architecture. But the same concept was that people can move objects around, change a location, and we keep a history of versions. And then on those cubes there that are floating, people can store their version or reload someone else's version. By simply pressing those cubes, they would compare the difference, whether, whether this slider here, for instance, would be more to the left or more to the right. They could simply click on the cubes to see and compare the versions. They could even choose one of these versions and then change it and create a tree of spatial versions. So this can then be used to quickly discuss alternatives for reconfiguring a space. In another primary school's example, what you did was help to, do, help to develop entrepreneurial skills. So in this case, the teacher was interested in in shops and businesses. And so we created manuals explaining how the teacher should organize the activities. We created examples, but the most critical part was a system where children could actually build their shops online for their products, but then adults from the community, parents and friends, could, would visit a replica of those shops and would communicate, not directly with children, 
but with the replica of the shops. We would then relay those messages to the actual teacher and students who could reply the same way. And in this way, children could experience actual management with the community of an online shop without actually being endangered with direct contact. So lots of examples, but what are the problems? The problems is that if the teacher wants to do this every day throughout the entire year, the teacher is besieged by chores, just like in a medieval castle. So we are talking about stuff that is not too bad if you do it once, but becomes horrible to do every single time. Like, how do I give specific objects to my students in this system? How do I check if this is student progress? I have 200 students, 500 students. How do I check the progress? Where can I find the work that each student has done to check it? And if students are complete, what did they submit? What is the final product? So these kind of tasks can be so troublesome and so, so slow that in fact teachers will try to do this just occasionally. So we, are, we have been tackling this for several years now. This is an example of one of my classes where I had this problem. I was called Endeavor de Mandelbrot because this was Second Life at the time. And the administrative clerks at, at the university said, you can do it like this, but you have to keep track of attendance. You must record who was and was not on the class. So all my students have different avatar names. I had to check for each avatar name, what is the actual name of the student? That was boring. Also, there was no sound of doors opening or closing, no rush of air as someone would pass. And so sometimes I would notice that a, n a different number of per people would be there. And I was wondering who left? Who arrived? This became quite a problem, not because of educational aspects, but because of administrative aspects. What we did was create a system where we would detect entrance and absence from class, record it in the database, and then a teacher could simply check for, for all students when the student was there, which we here use a green bar, and when the student was absent, for which here we use a red bar. So I can more readily check simply who was there for most of the class and wasn't, and who, who was absent for a small couple of minutes or was absent for a long period. Portal Telecom, which is now called Altis Labs, had a major problem with its training system because uh, this company provided training for thousands of people in, in many, many companies like the aircraft company TAP, or to the Portuguese uh, Chamber of Lawyers, to several banks. So there were many circumstances where this was not acceptable to be able to enjoy 3D environments. So we worked with them for many years and provided several solutions. But also very importantly, we became aware of the major problems and we published them in, in the Immersive Learning Research Network conference four years ago. There you'll find more than 80 identified problems, stuff like how do we ensure readily that only enrolled students participate? How can an administrator check what teachers are doing? Because if you are managing lots of teachers, you need to be able to understand what's going on. And who sets up the immersive space? Is the teacher the person in charge of making sure this technical system is entirely running or can it be delegated under teacher instructions to someone that can automate it for let's like, say thousands of rooms every day. The system we came up with basically was a connection between the Portugal Telecom learning management system and Second Life and Open Simulator. So on a web page, the teacher or the course coordinator could simply configure everything that was required and necessary and be ensured that when the classes were going on, attendance, object provision, services were all taking place as intended. And we published our approach for this in a couple of papers. Most promisingly, we have now tried to leverage this learning recently into a 10 country European project with several companies to try to take this to schools. And we managed to make tests with more than 4,000 students in several countries. So, our logic is that a plot editor 
which would be a game designer can provide a game, but leave it open so that learning specialists can then link it to learning. So these learning designers, which can be either experienced teachers or people working on learning, learning in the educational technology companies can provide what we would call a gamified lesson plan. A lesson plan where the games and other activities are embedded and automatically provided and recording analytics. Then teachers can simply say, I want to use this with my class and everything gets connected and adapted procedurally. Our approach though is that the learning designer is basically using a diagram like the one on the left to connect the narrative of the game to the activities in the class. And those activities can include other mini games, other smaller activities that can even be provided by companies that are not the company that developed the first game. So this becomes an open ecosystem where people in companies can actually provide full planned lesson plans and then make them available for different schools. For assessment, we collect analytics on several dimensions and let the lesson plan designer link them to a, a system to track student progress. So you can basically try using what we call a triadic certification approach. You can have different training levels, you can have different challenges and mechanics on games, and you have the competences and the skills you want to follow up with. And you can map all of this together with what's happening in those games so that you have a better overview of what actually is going there. This is much, much more, more detailed than a test which just tells you specific stuff you asked because you get this information from what people actually did in the game, what people actually did in the educational activities. This becomes easier for teachers and students to use because teachers can follow the entire class for all courses on what's going on and students don't become lost with lots of games to play. They get a list of activities, they get a sequence, they can start and interrupt and then check what's going on, what they have pending, what they have opened but not even started, what they have finished. They can follow up what's, what the teachers, the various teachers told them to do. And what we want to do now, and we are calling this the Invenira platform for inventive activity plans. We are working on the software engineering side for which we are going to do publications this year still is Take this one step further. This approach is not just for games or immersive activities. This approach can actually empower teachers for any kind of complex, rich and diversified activity to be done in a massive scale. So we are talking about students interviewing elders. We are talking about hands-on laboratory activities. We are talking about field activities. And of course, simulations and games, but basically, we believe that this kind of approach of a planning by a learning designer connecting the technology and the various field and data collection aspects into, into what we are calling an inventive activity plan can be the key to a much more powerful, diversified and effective learning and taking both online and physical learning much further into a much richer dimension than it has so far. So thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any queries, just send me an email and I'm open for proposals on research cooperation, joint supervisions of students, etc. Just get in touch. Thank you.